Um, so doing the interviewing tonight will be Elizabeth McCracken, um, again, one of my favorite people on Twitter, uh, who's the author of seven books. Uh, Elizabeth's received grants and fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the NEA, the Liguria Study Center, American Academy in Berlin, the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, Radcliffe, and many others. Her work has been published in the Best American Short Stories, the Pushcart Prize, the Henry Prize, the New York Times Magazine, and many other places. Her new novel, very exciting, coming this fall, is called The Hero of This Book. Very excited um, to learn about that. And we recently learned that Elizabeth has some Philly connections um, at both Drexel and Penn. So welcome back. And we're here to celebrate tonight the new novel, The Family Chow from Lansom and the Chang. Um, again, very special, been a fan of, uh, of Lansom and the Chang since high school, teenagehood. Um, it's been wonderful to watch as a writer um, from far away and also um, eminent overseer of the Iowa Writers Workshop um, for adults and precocious teens. So uh, Lynn Samantha Chang is the author of three novels and a story collection, Hunger. Her short stories have appeared in The Atlantic Monthly, Plowshares, Best American Short Stories, many other exciting places. Also in NEA, the uh, Guggenheim Foundation Grant, American Academy in Berlin, is the director of University of Iowa Writers Workshop. She lives with her husband and daughter in Iowa City. Um, her new novel, The Family Chow, was published just recently in February by W.W. Norton to substantial excitement and acclaim. It was called um, by NPR, a riveting story of identity and belonging, and the New York Times Review is too glowing to summarize. So I will hand things off to Liz McCracken and Lynn Samantha Chang. Congratulations, and thank you so much for being with us. Thank Thanks, you. Emma. Hi, Sam. How are you? good how are you doing i'm good i love this book i have it here it's a visual aid um it's so wonderful and um i'm really excited to talk to you about it and one of the things i was struck by when i read it is that it's a book that's about large issues it's about um race and immigration and americanness and chineseness and anti-asian prejudice and violence and god and inheritance um, and family. And it's also just an amazing read. It has so many, um, for some reason, the word I keep going back to is old fashioned. And it may just be that I, it's, I feel like it's been a while since I've read a novel that both, I really want to talk about the beginning, which announces itself, its intentions. Um, and uh, then um just keeps going and there are plot twists and the characters are beautiful and maddening um I feel this is something I should have asked you before we started but do you want to read a little bit from it oh yeah I can start. the answer is no you can say no. no 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 um I'll just read from the very beginning there's like that a would be great page okay peace for 35 years, everyone supported Leo Chow's restaurant, introducing choosy newcomers by showing off some real Chinese food in Haven, Wisconsin, bringing children, parents, grandparents, not wanting to dine out with the Americans, not wanting to think about which fork to use. You could say the manifold tensions of life in the new country, the focus on the future, tracking incremental gains and losses, were relieved by the fine Chow sitting down under the dusty red lanterns, gazing at Leo's latest calendar with the limp-haired Taiwanese sylphs that Winnie hated so much, waiting for supper, everyone felt calm. In dark times, when you're feeling homesick or defeated, there's really nothing like a good steaming soup and dumplings made from scratch. Winnie and Big Leo Chow were serving scallion pancakes decades before you could find them outside of a home kitchen. Leo, 35 years ago, winning his first poker game against the owners of a local poultry farm, exchanged his chips for birds that Winnie transformed into the shining chestnut-colored duck dishes of far-off cities. Dear Winnie, rolling out her bing the homemade way, two pats of dough together with a seal of oil in between, letting them rise to a steaming bubble in the piping pan. Leo bargaining for hard-to-get ingredients, Winnie subbing wax beans for yard-long beans, plus home growing the garlic greens, 
chives and hot peppers you used to never find in Haven, their garden giving away off a glorious smell. You could say the community ate its way through the Chow family's distress, not caring whether Winnie was happy, whether Big Chow was an honest man. Everyone took in the food on one side of their mouths, and from the other side they extolled the parents for their son's accomplishments, heaping praise upon the three boys who grew up all bright and ambitious, who earned scholarships to good colleges, commending them for leaving the Midwest. Yet everyone was thankful when the oldest, Dago Chow, returned to Haven. Dago coming home to his mother, moving into the apartment over the restaurant, working there six days a week. Dago, the most passionate cook in the family. Despite the trouble between Winnie and Big Chow, everyone assumed the business would be handed down fairly, peacefully, father to son. Now, a year after the shame, the intemperate and scandalous events that began on a winter evening in Union Station, the community defends its 35-year indifference to the Chow family's troubles by saying, no one could have believed that such good food was cooked by a bad person. Oh, it's so good. And I had this as a question to ask you later on, but the food in this book is so amazing. And I was trying to figure out why it's such a pleasure to read about food. Um, it, there's, a, there's just a vein of, of food all the way through this. And I, I wonder if you can talk about how you thought about writing. I mean, there's there's drama to it. It's a, an intrinsic part of the of the plot. I mean, one thing about Chinese food for me is that I grew up in an era when you could hardly find the ingredients to Chinese food where I was living. So my parents came from China to the U.S. and then they moved to Wisconsin at a time when really the closest soy sauce could be gotten three hours away in Chicago. So every, like every six months maybe, they would drive to Chicago, load up the station wagon with soy sauce and like things in cans, like condiments that you couldn't get, um, and fresh tofu and vegetables, and you know various kinds of bok choy or Napa cabbages. And they would drive back to Appleton and we would eat up all the food for maybe three weeks and then the fresh stuff would be gone and my parents would be left with like condiments that they then used to stir fry iceberg lettuce and things that they found at the Red Owl supermarket. Um, you know, they tried to make food that tasted like Chinese food to them. But as a result, I think their cuisine, it evolved and I grew up eating food that was an approximation of the food that they had grown up with. Um, this was always really interesting to us as a family. My parents had this kind of test kitchen in in their kitchen where they would their American friends who were basically for a long time white would come to the house and my mom would try stuff out on them to see if they liked it or not. Um, and she, she kept lists of what the Americans ate and what they wouldn't eat. And that was really, in some ways, the basis for my vision of the restaurant kitchen in The Fine Chow. The Chow family arrives in Wisconsin, you know, very many years ago, and they have to figure out what people will eat and won't eat. Um, it's, it's an amazing setup for a book. And, and I love that beginning, which just announces the, sort of the stakes of the book before the, before the action starts. Did you always know it was going to start that way? No. Um, no, not I. It, the beginning is probably one of the last things I wrote for the book. That and like one of the points of view, and then maybe a couple points of view that move through it. And then there's also another section similar to the beginning, told in the same voice about halfway through. I wrote that really close to the end also. Is that the part about Winnie? and her son's thinking about them no actually it was it's the it sort of introduces the second half and it says when the when the um you know family right the americans felt this way about them right. and then eventually they started to see them um because one of the things about the book is it's divided in two halves the first half is this family's private matters sort of the way that they relate to each other and and the 
conflicts and crisis that erupt. Um, and then the second half of the book, it describes how this conflict and crisis is seen outside of the family. Um, so that is also introduced by one of these little, little bits. Did you know, because the, the point of view is really interesting and complicated. And there are, <clears throat> again, there are sort of old fashioned aspects. There's a, there's a courtroom drama yeah. that takes over a lot of the book and, and conversations in which characters accuse, have realizations and accuse each other of things. But there are also comment sections and blog posts. And yeah. um, it's so interesting. And I, did, I guess the, it's the same question. Did you know, how did you come up uh, across these different? Okay, so there's a line in the Brothers Karamazov, which is, this book is an homage to the Brothers Karamazov. So there's a line like two thirds of the way through or something when the courtroom drama of that book gets started and the narrator who's been a first person omniscient narrator throughout and basically seems to get all of their information from gossip um, kind of mentions his presence in the courtroom it says sort of like I was there but I can't relay this in good you know very clearly or even in the right order and and I thought I would like this book to be about the community narrating um, not a specific person, but in the courtroom, I decided, sure, why not? So there's a there's a character named Lynn Chin whose parents don't want her to become a journalism major. They want her to marry and major in data analytics, and she she uses the court the the trial as an assignment. She tries to um, blog about it because one of her journalistic assignments is to learn to write a blog, and she kind of fails at her assignment. But she does manage to convey a lot of what's happening in the courtroom. Yeah, it's sort of, it's a kind of wonderfully clamorous book because there are so many voices and people shouting over each other and 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 interrupting. Will you talk a little bit about your relationship with the Brothers Karamazov as a book? Yeah, I didn't read it until I was forty years old. I had a student, um, an undergrad before I even came to Iowa, who was interested in the book, a Russian literature major, and I thought, oh, I, you know, I'm embarrassed that I haven't read this. I should read this. Sat down and read it. I was just blown away by it. I think it's, you know, just a stunning, brilliant, amazing major piece of world literature, you know. Um, but it's also a lot of fun. And and then I went through this period where I was just like anybody who's read a book they love. I was just desperate to find people to talk to about it. So I would do these kind of slightly pushy um, sign up sheets uh, at the writer's workshop saying, you know, I promise that I will read the Brothers Karamazov over Thanksgiving break and meet with Sam to talk about it. And we would talk for like six hours. We'd break it into two halves and talk for hours at a time because the book is, you know, close to 800 pages long. And it, there's just also a lot to talk about. Um, and then at some point, you know, I became really interested in the present tense and that sense of unfolding that it has. And I realized that there's a match between that kind of unfolding and the way that time is handled in the first half of Dostoevsky's book. And I just started thinking, wouldn't it be fun? Wouldn't it be fun to write an homage to that book? It would have to be in the present tense. And obviously love, set in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> I love the present tense in this book. And do you, I, I feel like I should be, I'm sure that as a, you know, that you're a, a teacher of creative writing and you have a lot of thoughts about past and present tense. Well, I, I always told people not to use it. So I feel like I'm really eating my words. Like I had essays that people had written um, about how bad the present tense was, and I would hand them out to people. <laughs> and then I just tried it. I was in between projects, which I hate. I hate being in between projects. And I was just r rattling off like random bits of things and knowing that they weren't going anywhere. And one of them was in the present tense and I really enjoyed it. And I thought, oh, you know, note to self, <laughs> stop telling everyone not to write in the present tense. I love that though I feel like you know we're of an age and 
you there the things that you have believed about writing and what makes good writing for years and then all of a sudden you think oh but is that true i don't know what's true you know i was talking to a creative writing teacher this afternoon who you know many had many many classes full of beginning writers and his take on it was there are these rules that people teach and the reason they teach them is to save time to save writers time so that they know that for example it's not great to write a lot in the passive um, voice and you know using a lot of exclamation points isn't helpful but i ended up i mean frank frank conroy told his son tim that he was only allowed to use two exclamation points in his entire life Oh my God, that's like a curse. That's not even advice. That's you will die after you use your second yeah, yeah, yeah. exclamation point. Yeah, or it was like Polyjuice Potion in Harry Potter. Oh no, not Polyjuice. What is the one where you, it's like the good luck potion, Felix Felicis. You, he, you know, he only used it twice. He gets two days of felicity. Um, but two, two sentences of enthusiasm. Yeah. I mean, in the Brothers Kermatsov by Dostoevsky, on the other hand, I think there are 2,300 exclamation points. <laughs> and my book has 219 exclamation points, which is a lot for me. Yeah, it's, and, and everyone is warranted. <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. You're welcome. <laughs> but I, I, like, I'm fascinated by the things that, because we went to Iowa not yeah. too far apart. No. And, there were the things that people said to me that I instantly went, no, that's not true. And then other things that took me a little while and then things that I'm still casting off. And actually one of the things I wanna ask you about for this book, because when I was at, I was there 88 to 90 and I think maybe you arrived in 90. I met you at the workshop in the photocopying room. You probably don't remember this, but I have a really vivid memory of meeting you. At EPB? Yeah. Oh. Connie introduced us. Oh, that's nice. Did you, but, but you started in the fall, right? I did. So, yeah. So we, any, anyhow. So don't, know my, how, don't know how it happened, but I remember it vividly. I, one of the things that we were absolutely, I mean, there are so many things that we were told that again, I, some of them I disagreed with for immediately, but is we were advised not to write about politics at all. Oh Yeah. And it was one of those things that I think a lot of people did sort of unthinkingly. They're like, oh, okay. Oh, that's right. Because if you write about politics, then it's propaganda. Um, and it seems, it's, I think it seemed false to me then because Grace Paley was one of my favorite writers. But I also feel like, how can you write about the world and avoid writing about politics? And there are, there are things in this book that are about the culture in a way that I think is really moving and entirely character driven. Not that I think everything has to be character driven, that we were told everything has to be character driven. And I wonder if you can talk about, but yeah. it's a double question. One, putting aside the stuff that you might've been told when you were a student, but also how you think about writing about larger social issues through the lens of fiction. So I think what's interesting is hearing you say that you heard some of these kind of rules and immediately thought, that's not right. I had more trouble with it than you did, I think. I think you always had a distinctive voice of, of your own. And I think in my case, um, it was such a big deal to even write about Asian characters. Hmm. I remember um, when I first arrived at the writer's workshop, Frank would take us into his office for 20 minutes and talk to us. Um, at least he did it up my year. But he told me, you need to stop writing about Chinese characters. You will be pigeonholed. And he was right. He he was right, not that I should stop writing about it, but that I would be pigeonholed. He was just trying to look out for me. And at the time, no one was, you know, I, so I felt like I was taking this huge step by doing that. And I wrote about sort of, I would say, like immigrant, lives of quiet desperation <laughs> um and it worked with all the rules we've been taught about not using very many words i don't know if you remember this um you know first of all no adverbs and probably no adjectives and definitely no you know just it was just uh it was just 
like that. And then something all along, I always felt that there was so much to life that I wasn't writing about. And people would read my work and they would say, Sam, you're kind of funny, but this isn't funny at all. Like, where? And I thought, <laughs> interesting, where am I in my work? It's not that I wasn't there, I was there, but that I have like 23 different personalities and like seven of them were missing. And I, or maybe 10, I mean, I just, uh, I started thinking I've got to be able to write about a family more like the family where I grew up, where we were, we led lives of like loud and noisy desperation. <laughs> um, you know, we were always laughing and screaming and like yelling and, and, you know, fighting. Um, it, it, and I couldn't, I tried in, in my first collection, there's a story that has a fight. And I remember reading it and writing it and over and over and thinking, this is not the way it felt at all. Hmm. And so when I ended up, every time I finish a book, I think I'm never going to write another book and I don't know what my next book's going to be like. And they're always very different. So when I started this one, one of the things that was pleasurable was that feeling that the characters were just going to shout at each other and I didn't care. And also the, the subject matter was going to be more about their actual lived experience. So at this time, there are a lot of words to describe what I went through growing up in, in you know, in the family that essentially integrated Appleton, Wisconsin. Um, microaggression is one word. Um, but when I was growing up, it was all stuff that I could feel was true, but I couldn't persuade anybody else was true. So, um, so I just decided to write a book in which what was happening was the way it really felt. And, and I just decided to, to, to do it. I think that was 2005 when I wrote the first part of it. And then when I got going on it in a major way in 2013, um, I think the world was changing a lot and um, people, people were willing to accept a really loud book about you know, all kinds of issues that, of, you know, that these particular Asian American characters experienced growing up where they did. Um, one of them in particular, Ming, uh, the middle son, his the little middle brother, his, has got a serious case of self-hatred, you know. Um, this, uh, this is now politicized. It's, it's a political issue. Um, Political essays are written, very political essays are written about Asian self-hatred. Um, I did not, I, I, I think that, I think that I, I think that my writing on these things is character driven. I guess I'm just fated to be character driven. Um, and, and that is interesting to me. And so I, I feel like I've been freed up a lot to write about things because the world has changed. I mean, it's the the characters are extraordinary. All of them, all the members of the immediate family, and then the the um, ancillary. Man, that's not the right word, but the other characters. It occurs to me, hearing you talk, that one of the things that the present tense does is it gives you the ability to write about extraordinary events because it's about very extraordinary events, and also give the lived lives of the character at the same time um which is yeah. what i think i think the things the book is so good at i think if the book had been written in in say retrospective past tense it would not have had the same kind of energy that it that it has or the same voice that it has so yeah i guess you're really right it has something to do with uh surprise yeah and that as things as things shift and change in the book and again it's the plot shifts and changes, our understanding of who the main characters are. I'm thinking about Ming, who's such a yeah. beautiful character and who's, who's uh, God, I'm trying to think of a word that's not journey, but who's, who's arc, there we go. Yeah, I'm a professional teacher of creative writing. I know these technical terms, whose arc through the book is so surprising and the way um, the point of view allows us to get closer to characters at different times. Did sure. you already know that that point of view was going to was going to shift like that? I mean, I had three points of view. I had the three brothers and then I had chunks from their perspective and uh, each of them long chunks and way too much of James, the youngest. And then at some point, 
um, I just started cutting uh, James a lot, cutting him back, trimming it back so that it was, the book was closer to the plot. And there's still plenty of James. But the, the, but the sort of different, the feeling of the book that it encompasses more than three points of view was put in fairly close to the end of the writing of it mm. when, um, you know, it, I, I showed it to a colleague of mine, um, Tom Drury, and he, he said that it needed air. And I started mm. thinking about that. Um, the point of view itself is so came along pretty late. Uh, it, it sort of moves from head to head at times. Um, it was a lot of fun. Once I figured out how to make things more omniscient, it was really actually quite fun, but it came quite late in the process because I was trained to write in an era when close third sticking to one close third was considered the way to go. Um, do you remember this? I do oh, vividly. Yeah. Or first, like my choice was I chose first, but that omniscience, I was interested to hear you say once I learned how to do it, because I, it, it's the training does have an effect when you're told, oh, this is the right way to completely go completely. from head to head. And you have to think, but it seems impossible otherwise. Right. It's like if you grew up feeling like you always had to wear pantyhose or something and then said <laughs> something about it to go bare legged. <laughs> it's or even to wear trousers. Yes. It is exactly like wearing trousers. Yeah. You can do more in trousers. Yes, it's true. You get places. You can travel in trousers. Yeah. Um, I I actually want to ask you about names in the book because they seem so essential. And one of my kids looked at the book and went, oh, the family chaos. And I yeah. went, oh, gosh, yes, you're right. Um, but names seem so important in this book and shifting. Yes, well, it's one of one of the ways that I find the brothers Karamazov like um, challenging, but also fun is that the characters all have each of them has several different names. I mean, that's just Russian. Um, so, you know, when when the oldest brother wants to talk about this woman he is in love with in a sort of nickname way, um, you know, he 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 or or actually in his fiance, his fiance his elegant fiance Katerina he calls her Katenka you know it's just a way of of making fun of her a little bit um I I just wanted I also thought about nicknames and I thought about Asian names and um American names and how so many of the Asian American people I know and everyone in my family has one Chinese name and one sort of American name and um, and then also there's a bunch of other names, nicknames. Um, Chinese people tend to, back, okay, I should say this. There is a tradition, it, it was from a long time ago, but sometimes still happening, of people naming their children after, sort of nicknaming their children after kind of humble objects or creatures to kind of fend off the gods you know, from noticing them, how beautiful they are. Uh, so uh, my dad told me about a family where they were named after dogs, big dog, second dog, third. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, that's going to be this family. They're going to be big dogs, second dogs. Um, and so there's just, everybody has more than one name in this book. Everyone has at least three names. The, the character Dago, the oldest son, his name is actually William. Um, and in the second half of the book where he's seen by the outside world his name is William it's weirdly shocking in the book when it switches from doggo to William yeah because you feel like you're in on the family and the culture of the family and then all of a sudden you realize no this is actually the outside view of the family I was uh, there were um two two other names I was wondering I was wondering whether James was named for Jim McPherson and also Jerry Stern Jerry Stern, what's up with Jerry? Is that a like a is that? Like oh, he was a poet who he was a poet who taught at the, oh, the Iowa Writing yeah. Workshop for years. But his name is spelled with a G, and mine is yes, a that's true. That's funny. Oh my goodness, I was talking to one of the poets in our department, and he said he heard me read, and he wanted to read because he wanted to know more about Jerry Stern. But it makes sense that <laughs> yeah, no Jerry Stern. That 
that's too easy a reach. I probably should have given him a different name. Um, you know, but- I don't think it's a problem. I, I read the book and then I just, before this event, I listened to the audio book. So oh, wow. I was no longer seeing the J. Yeah, yeah, and it becomes Gerald Stern. Crazy. He was always in and out of the office when we were at the program. Very, very eccentric and charming person. He used to sing really loudly when he was walking around in the mm-hmm. in the office. It um, was sort of nice to picture because to picture Jerry Stern as this small character in your in your book, and then Jerry Stern walks in, and he's always referred to as Jerry Stern in the book. Yeah. Um, Jim. Okay, so James is not named after James. Alan McPherson. Um, I've always liked the name James and I just named him James. He seemed like a James to me, but it's really funny because I just got an email yesterday from one of my former students saying that he thought that he was James. And I'm like, because his name is James. And I'm like, no, no, no. Seriously, if I wanted to write about you, I would not name the person James. I would seal it. I would make some small effort. Um, no, Jim McPherson is, you know, I, I, actually dedicated the book to Jim who died in 2016. Um, he was my teacher when I was uh, in the program. And, you know, he just, he, he was just very funny. I thought he would enjoy reading it and, you know, enjoy the dirty jokes and the off color remarks and the things that I think he would, he probably gave me permission to, to put in the book somehow. And the, and the legal stuff, the legal uh, plot line? True, he's a like it. I didn't think of that. I, I was mostly concerned about trials. Um, I don't think he was a trial lawyer, but yeah, I, I mostly talked to my, my brother-in-law, um, who's, a, who's, a, who's a litigator, and um, he actually gave me a murder case transcript, which was oh, wow. so many pages long. It was so many pages long, <laughs> and I read the whole thing. Uh, and I realized when I read it that actually even though stories are very, very important to law, the way that stories unfold within a trial is nothing like the way that they unfold in a narrative. So I had to do some tinkering with it. Um, can I ask you about teaching and writing? Do, you, do they feel connected to you? So, I mean, I'm curious to know what you think about that too. <laughs> um, but in this book, they're very connected. Um, I feel like my students, I mean, they're kind of a wonderful bunch. They're a large, wonderful bunch. And the kind of writing they do varies a lot. And the sort of freshness and energy they bring to their writing is palpable. And there's something about reading sort of really fresh work by people who are just discovering writing. It's like getting, it's really like mainlining or something. It's just so intense and exciting that I think that some of that excitement wore off on me. And, you know, people attempting to do things, watching them people attempt to do things, you know, it it gives me energy. an inspiration. And ultimately, I think, I mean, I've been teaching at the workshop for so long now that a couple of my students actually read this and suggested stuff. Like one of them told me, people do not, young people do not say making love anymore, Sam. (laughs) And I had to go through the whole thing and change it to have sex. Yeah, it does. It feels a like a bit of a seventies, mm-hmm. but nice. Oh, it's yeah. what a nice. That's how a nice lady would describe it. Really nice. Yeah, nice lady. <laughs> Not these kids, though. Not the kids in the book. I call them kids, but they're in their twenties and thirties. <laughs> um. So I want to know if you found teaching inspiring for your writing or whether it's, I mean, it does take a lot of time, for example. I do. Um, I think it's, it it has changed for me a lot in the past, maybe 10 years, 
And then if you'd asked me before that, I would have said, oh, I really love teaching. I really love writing, but it's a little retaining wall between the two of them. And, um, and I, for a long time, was a visitor. I visited at Iowa a lot. And I would, I would teach and read stuff and work flat out for a semester. And then I would go off and write. And so even in the, the year, they were separate. But I think I, I, so much of the way that I teach, I had wonderful teachers at Iowa. Um, and I think a lot of those rules that we're talking about, oh, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. A lot of that came from my fellow students more oh, than faculty. Sure. Sure, like Jim Jim McPherson would never have brought rules into the classroom. There are always those guys, Sam, those guys sitting around the table who would say, oh, well, you really, you, you can't do this or you should. No, that's really true. Yeah. When yeah. Kundera writes about this kind of subject matter, I remember that very clearly from a class. Um, <laughs> I feel, <laughs> I, I feel like for a long time, um, mostly what I did when I taught ran counter to that and said, and I would say, I don't particularly believe in rules. And then maybe eight years ago, I started listening to my own advice and then teaching and writing seemed very connected. And I similarly feel like reading the new stuff by young people is exciting. And also reading what they read that I feel yeah. much more current in that way, because yeah. I know what my students are excited about. And that seems, since I stopped being a public librarian, I sort of had missed being on top of things. And now I, I read what my students read when I can. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. No, it's great. I, I you know, I feel really lucky. It does take up a lot of time, but not as much time as, as administration does. I think that's... <laughs> More time. Yes. I think I had a note that said, I want to ask you, Sam, how does administration feed your fiction? Do you find it inspiring? I one way that it does. I've thought yeah? about it. Yeah. When I first became director, um, I had to write a ton of memos. It was back in the day, I don't know, where you had to sort of write down everything that was going on with your program, describe things. If you wanted something, you had to explain why. And I, I developed this third person or maybe sometimes it was this royal we, but whatever it was, it was this kind of authoritative um, voice in which I would describe things that were not myself or my feelings. <laughs> and it was surely after that, that I was discovered, I was able to write a novel from the point of view of a white man. That's so interesting. Yeah, it was my, my uh, third book. Yeah. And a lot of people, you know, had things to say about the book you know, issues maybe with parts of the book, but nobody said this does not sound like white man. <laughs> and, you know, back when, back in the day, I wrote really close to my own experience when I was starting off. Um, it was nothing, it was never autobiographical, but it, it was always something, it was a short reach from where I was. I couldn't reach very far. And I feel like being an administrator has enabled me to reach um, much further. Oh, that's I'm I'm thrilled to think that university administration is good for something. I guess. I mean, I try to look at the bright side, you know. I'm gonna look at our QA. Okay. And if anybody has questions, um, please put them in the in the chat. And so they're just Sam, mostly they're compliments. Huh. Um, what do your students read? Sorry, I shouldn't look at yeah. it because I get confused. No, 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 no. What do your students read? And, and do you generally like what they read? Oh, whoa, that is, I don't know if I want to answer that question. That's such an interesting <laughs> question. I'm curious to know what you think about this. Well, I am not going to insult anything they read. Uh, uh, what are they reading? There are a ton of people reading different things. Um, so I... When I first started teaching, there were a lot of people who were still like very much interested in certain kinds of, I don't know, experimental work from a certain generation. So David Foster Wallace, a lot of David Foster Wallace. There was a period when a ton of people were reading Dennis Johnson. 
Um, right now, people are reading Raven Leilani. Mm -hmm. um, they're reading Great Carmen, book, Walter. Yeah, Carmen Maria Machado. Uh, and, you know, it's always really cool to see what they're reading. What I notice is that they're often reading things that um, are sort of breaking off from what they grew up reading, you know, something different. But right now, a ton of them are reading Middlemarch for a class that Jamil Brinkley is teaching. So the conversation around our building right now is about Middlemarch. That's, that's very exciting. It is. It is great, actually. And they seem to be enjoying it a lot. I, f I feel like I'm a little behind in what students are reading because of the pandemic. So I spend, Sorry. I just taught my first workshop in person, my first graduate workshop in person last Monday. Were you wearing a mask? Yes. Okay. In a, a mask and in, in a, a seminar room with all of the windows open. And it, wow. it felt good. Um, I don't know how you feel about Zoom. This is delightful. Being able to talk one to one. But yeah. when there are too many, it's like talking to a box of mice. And <laughs> I'm very glad to be back in person. But I feel... Did you, how much, how much teaching virtually did you do? I did, um, gosh, I mean, you know, the rest of 2020, so from March mm -hmm. on, and then the whole following year, last year was pretty much on Zoom. Toward the end of the year, they started having parties again, which was great. I threw one. Um, I threw this party to celebrate graduation and had like, what is it bubbly shit bubbly wine or whatever fizzy wine and then they brought like a keg <laughs> at one point the party got completely out of control and i remember looking around me thinking they are not going to leave but they were so happy to actually be able to talk to each other again um it was like i'd completely lost control of the party uh, this fall though at the workshop everything went back in in person except for a couple of classes where you know, either the instructor or a student would have like a reason why they really had to be careful. And so right. the class would be on Zoom or held outside. Like Ethan held a lot of his class. Ethan Kanan held a lot of his classes at this kind of, I guess it's the Iowa City equivalent of a beer garden hmm. uh, with heaters. Uh, so they would sit outside and talk. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we loosened up pretty early on because of the state basically sort of um, forbidding mask mandates, et cetera. But isn't Texas the same way? It is the same way. But yeah. people have mostly, most of my students have worn masks. My graduate students have entirely. Yeah, the grad students wear masks, but you've been on Zoom, you said, including last semester? I was, I last semester I taught in person, but outside, because I taught one very okay. small class. So this okay. is my first, and then I taught a, a Zoom workshop. But it's love. I mean, I miss... Again, this is this is also lovely, but I, I miss going to readings. I miss being an audience member. It was lovely to hear you read. I feel like it's been a long time since I since somebody has read to me. Oh. And that I mean, particular feeling of reading somebody reading something that you already read and loved. Yeah. I mean, I I actually gave a reading in person uh Sunday wow. at the Angler Theater. It was the big like opening up of the readings um, here in Iowa City and it was really exciting for me. I got a little scared and overwhelmed after a while okay. though, um, answering questions and things because I wasn't used to doing it in front of people. But it was really, really wonderful. It's so much, it's so interesting how I feel like we took so much for granted. <laughs> It's true. Yeah, it's true. I have hopes that we'll we'll be back in crowded bookstores. Does anyone have libraries? Any questions? People? Maybe? Q and A. Just great discussion. Well, they like that. They like the discussion. So I'll ask because I'm in Texas, I'll ask a, a Texas adjacent question, which is that Texas is very serious about Texan writing and, and thinking about a literature of the state. And I wonder if you 
you feel like as somebody who grew up in the Midwest and live in the Midwest, if you have a sense of yourself as a Midwestern writer? I do indeed. I don't know if I always did because I grew up in Wisconsin 18 years and then I went to the East Coast for about eight years and moved around there and then I went to to Iowa for two years and then California for quite a while and back to the East Coast. I mean, I mean, then finally I became sort of situated here and it felt very comfortable to me. I, I, I've always been... Um, sort of an admirer of certain Midwestern writers, William Maxwell, for example, um, or writers of the West, um, you know, uh, Willa Cather. Um, there's, there's a feeling here. I would say that people aren't proud in a very loud way about the literary tradition here because nobody around here brags about things. They're always very understated. Um, you know, it'll be like negative 23 degrees and someone will say, yeah, it's cold out there. <laughs> you know? And that's, that's what it's like here. Um, but there's so many wonderful writers. Uh, and I think somehow that I feel like I'm in, in the center of something, you know, um, I am like literally in the center because I'm five hours from you know, Kansas City and six hours from St. Louis and four hours from Milwaukee or, you know, no, Madison. You know, it's just everything is, oh, Omaha. Everything's like several hours away except Des Moines, which is two hours away. So we are kind of in the middle of something or you might call it the middle of nowhere. But there's definitely a feeling, uh, an identity that I think comes through in a lot of, of American fiction. I don't know. Um, it would be, I mean, when I think about the American writers who spent a lot of time in the Midwest, I mean, you can go just in the 20th century to uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald from you know St. Paul, Minnesota, and Ernest Hemingway, who spent a lot of time in Michigan. And, um, and those are two of the big ones, but there's so many, you know, there's so many other people. Um, I'm from Appleton, Wisconsin, and Edna Ferber uh, is from Appleton, Wisconsin. Wow. I know. Is she a presence in Appleton, Wisconsin? Not really, no. <laughs> the two big ones are Harry Houdini, who claims to have been born there, or right. claims, although no one's really sure where he was born, and... Um, and Senator Joseph McCarthy is the other big Appletonian person. Um, but you know, when I think about uh, the writing in the Midwest, one thing that comes to my mind is there are a lot of immigrants who settled in the upper Midwest and wrote you know, works of American literature that were read a lot, in, especially in the 20th century, but still now, like Laura Ingalls Wilder, mm -hmm. um, or Bess Streeter Aldrich, has anyone read that oh, yeah. um, she, I think it was settling in South Dakota again. Um, the thing is, as a as a child of immigrants who came to the Midwest and kind of settled there in the middle of a sort of completely foreign culture, I feel a kinship with those writers, the pioneer writers, and I spent a lot of time reading things like that when I was little, a ton. You know, this whole idea of like food being far away and the weather being very cold. You know, like my mom grew up in Shanghai, which is in the, in the same latitude as Jacksonville, Florida. So like it was very cold and the food was far away. And, you know, communicating with people was difficult because at the time there was no internet, no Skype or Zoom or whatever. Like you had to write letters, phone calls were expensive. Um, it just had that kind of pioneering, middle of nowhere, we have to depend on each other kind of feeling. The other thing I was really um, into when I was growing up was this television show, Gilligan's Island. Do you remember this? Which was always in rerun. It was yep. in rerun like every day after school three times on two different channels. Um, and, and they reminded me of our family. Um, they were in the middle of nowhere. They were struggling to figure out, you know, how to make do with, available supplies and things. 
It's that's very touching. That's a it's touching really notion. I think, we, I think it's kind of weird, actually. It's like my generation, but pretty much people don't have these problems anymore. Yeah, it's true. We we, we have a, a bunch of late breaking um oh my questions. God. Oh wow. We, we have um from Margot Livesey. Oh, one of the many things I love about the family Chow is Doggo's, Doggo's subversive radio broadcast and how you <laughs> use it in almost supernatural ways. Was this part of the novel all along? Yes, it was. I went to a residency. I happened to sit down at dinner with some guy who do, did pirate radio and asked him a bunch of questions. And I thought, wow, it would be really cool to have pirate radio in my book. So I did a bunch of research on pirate radio and I sort of pelted him with more questions. He kind of moved further down the table after that. I'm sure he thought <laughs> I did not come here for this, but, um, but it was, it became um, a way of sort of broadcasting the individual personal story of the character to an unknown audience. So it worked as the, as the plot. And, and then later on um, it kind of, uh, sort of moves to the next level and becomes somewhat supernatural. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a fascinating decision because it really it, it's. I feel I feel like the characters are always invading each other's dreams and privacy, and there's something about Doggo's voice coming in that's so strange and beautiful. Thanks. Another question: How closely mapped to Karamazov is your Chow family? in terms of character, plot, and even tone? Yeah, I would say that the tone um, ha shares elements with Dostoevsky. I am now rereading the book. I did not read it for six years because I didn't want to just get so intimidated that I wouldn't be able to sort of imagine my, my fictional world. Um, after I realized I was doing an homage, I thought it would probably be best not to, based on an essay that Margot herself wrote about mm. homages. Um, and I guess, the, but I did have this idea of the three brothers, and the three brothers are not exactly like the brothers in Dostoevsky, who are all on some level struggling with questions about God and faith and Christianity. Um, these brothers are struggling more with issues of identity, birth, birth order, um, sort of whether or not they play the role of the obedient child that they were brought up to believe they should be in an Asian cultured family, or whether they should go off into the world and um, strike out on their own as, you know, they learned um, as they grew up in an American culture. Um, but I would say that the, the oldest one is big and loud and drinks a lot and has trouble controlling his emotions and feelings, which is in some ways similar to um, Mitya. And he's a sensualist like Mitya. They're all sensualists. So in that way, it's also similar to the brothers Kermatsov. And being the middle one, he's, he's, uh, he's, he does better in school than the others. He's more cerebral, not exactly like Ivan. He doesn't have the same... Um, spiritual disorders, but he does have a disorder of his own. You know, he's struggling through the whole book. And then James, very sweet. Um, you know, it's funny when I was when I was writing the book, I thought about the tarot card a lot. And for me, James was the fool. Um, so I feel like I was following the fool as he's walking through the book, you know, holding his belongings over his shoulder. Um, that was James. And in that way, I think Alyosha wanders through the brothers Karamazov, bringing us from place to place uh, in the first part of the book as we meet all of the other characters because they're in conversation with Alyosha. That happens in my book. Um, but it's really interesting. I was as rereading this section and thinking, how did Dostoevsky complete that drive that makes you read forward through these sections? Because it's like exposition one, two, three, four, five. I mean, like, you know, I don't know, 20 chapters of exposition. I had to create a dog and have the dog get loose <laughs> and be following the dog. Or it felt like there was no momentum at all, you know? Um, so, yeah. That's another thing we were told. No exposition. Everything should be in scene. Everything should be. Oh, yeah. The words in scene. Yeah. I'd prefer in a scene. In scenes. Anyway, yeah, no. Uh, 
I think exposition is necessary sometimes. Yeah. I love some. I love good exposition. Yeah, me too. Me too. We have a question from Susan Power. Hi, Susan. Susan. Oh my God. Hi. Great to see you both. My question: When we were at Iowa, there were few women students as teachers. Do you have a more even situation in terms of gender? If so, how does that change class dynamics from a more male dominated classroom? This is, this is true. Like when I, when I first, the first year that I was in the program, um, there were like, it was it, th was it two thirds men or three quarters? It was wow. really close. Yeah. And Susan was, I always looked up to Susan so much because she seemed to have this kind of calm <laughs> you know she would be calm and people were mean and competitive all around us in class and susan had a serenity that made me feel better <laughs> the whole time i was there i think the few women that we did have in when i when i first came in we we kind of hung out together we had women women dinners women fiction dinners where we would have these delicious meals um it was awesome. Um, but I don't know, I think our program now, it's close to half and half. Sometimes, sometimes it's, it's more women than men. There's also other genders now, um, which is, you know, interesting. It makes class more dynamic. Um, it's really different. It's, it's much less of that sort of I don't even know how to describe it. I don't know. How would you describe it, Elizabeth? Like a seventh grade dance. <laughs> and specifically seventh grade in that you sometimes, and I, I don't think my class was as sharply that there were that many more men. And I had a lot of wonderful um, friends who were men when I was there. Some just wonderful friends. But sometimes in a class, there would feel like men on one side of the room and women at the other sort of staring at each other and giving each other like it was it was fraught yeah i wonder why and and most of the faculty i the faculty was always i think three-fourths men there would be a oh. and i don't think there was a i don't think there was a single woman teaching there on the fiction side um my first semester Serious? wow see we had margo Right. Yeah, which made everything better. Man, Margo arrived. Margo and Marilyn both arrived after I had graduated. Well, that's so interesting. That's really interesting. Uh, Deborah Eisenberg was there when I was there. Also. Oh, wow. Amazing. We, had, I mean, Meg Wallitzer was there, though. I didn't get a chance to study with her. And Susan Deitch and Betty Pazetsky and Elizabeth Talent. And I think maybe. Oh. But I think they were all there at different, <laughs> different semesters. Wow. Yeah. No, so they couldn't talk to each other, in other words. <laughs> I mean, it's true. I mean, actually, one of my closest friends is one of the guys from workshop from when I was back at, at Iowa. So I did have really close male friends. Um, but my very first class is how I always remember it. It was me, two other women and 11 guys. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. But no, it's very different now. What about at your program in Texas? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, people of all genders and, um, and it doesn't feel because of that. I mean, I think because in general, we now think of ourselves as an animal as being much more multivalent and complicated and not with, you know, sort of hard little bubbles to tick off on intake forms, everything is better because we're not no longer sorting ourselves into, into bins. I, did, I feel like just in terms of sitting around the, the seminar table that it makes things feel more open and yeah. possible. Yeah. Sam, it's 7.31. Oh, bummer. I oh. know. Well, it's such a pleasure to talk to you, Elizabeth, and it's so nice to be in Philadelphia. <laughs> I know, at the library. At the library. <laughs>